Coming up on today's show, new details about the upcoming Witcher game, PlayStation bought another studio, and Britney has been playing a horny casino game. What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by Miss Brittany Brombacher. It is me, the one who has bl- been playing the horny casino game, but it's more <laughs> of like a horny farming game. I just said casino because I'm, I'm projecting the spirit of Alexa Ray, who was here last week. Yes, she is the fanniest fangirl of, of horny casino games, um, at least from how much money she spent on them standpoint. <laughs> I don't blame her. Spin the wheel, get a husbando. <laughs> Listen, we all spend a lot of money on our husbandos and waifus. It's just part of being, you know, in love, I guess. <laughs> or in lust. I don't know. Either one. Cheers. <laughs> cheers to that. Uh, cheers to you, Brittany. Cheers. Mm. Um, welcome, everybody. Whether it is your first episode or your 268th episode, we're glad that you are joining us this week. We've got some news for you. But first, I'd like to say thank you to our Patreon producers, Chewy's Godson, Alex Rogopoulos, David. Icolucci, Ferris Atia, Justin Foshi, Matthew Goddard, and Punctified. Uh, Ferris reached out to me because he is up at GDC. The Game Developers Conference is happening this week, and normally Brittany and I would be at GDC testing out some games, doing some developer mm. interviews. We've actually done the What's Good Games podcast from GDC um, before, and it's been lots of fun, but unfortunately, neither of us are there this week because we're at home with La Bebe's. And the little screaming humans that we love so much exactly. and so unconditionally. Uh-huh. You know, we're still working on the pre-alpha builds of these humans. They need a little bit more <laughs> QA testing before they're ready to ship out. So uh, <laughs> hopefully okay. everybody is having a wonderful time, or I should say at this point, by the time the podcast airs, had a wonderful time. And we will, of course, catch you guys up with any major news or announcements that came out of GDC. It seems like it's going well, though, which is good. That major FOMO girl. Yeah. Look at that same. Twitter. All of our friends hanging out in I person. Know. They're all like, oh, ah. we went out to dinner at this place. And, oh, I'm playing this game. Or, oh, I have this suite where I'm talking to this developer. And I'm like, oh, I miss conferences. <laughs> oh. I someday. Someday soon they will come back. It feels like the world is just finally starting to get its feet under it. Just in time for like a together. wave of like seven new variants of COVID to come storming through the door. I know. Uh, I was talking to my pediatrician about traveling with our infant. Our infant is he still an infant? Yeah, newborn? And up until infant. one year, they're an infant, and then okay, they become okay, a toddler. Okay. And he was like, "Yo, real talk. If you want to travel, now is the time to do it because there's, you know, a new variant coming." I was like, "Cool, thanks. It's fine. It's fine." Andrea. I think that's just our future now, right? It's it just, is. It it's is. always going to yeah. be a thing. It is. It's okay. Yeah, it's fine. Exactly. It's fine. Yeah, just keep drinking, Brittany. Good job. Mm-hmm. Um, welcome to our Patreon community, Vault 31 Bar. We're glad that you are here. If you guys want to help support our voices in video games and get the show ad-free, you can do so at patreon.com slash what's good games. Another way to help us out and not spend any dollars, but just a couple minutes of your time is to leave us a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. And Brittany, it looks like we got a couple new reviewers this week. We do. We have Off in a Corner and Rubble Bloom. <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't know how to say that, but I did my very best. We appreciate your reviews. They keep us high up on those little apple apple chitty charts and helps people find our show. And we appreciate it greatly. Andrea, I do want to talk about Vault 31 Bar real quick because I was like, okay, this sounds like a legit establishment. And I Googled it. And it's actually a bar in Vancouver, Washington. It's a barcade, if you will. It looks so much fun. You can rent consoles and you can play all sorts of games. Their tagline is like from Pog to PS5. Pong, excuse me. Not I was going to say, they have Pogs? I actually just found Dude. my old Pogs when I was going through an, a closet to clear it out for the grandparents who are coming into town in a couple weeks. And I found oh. my original Pogs from when I was like eight years old. Dude, Pogs and the Slammers. Oh, my God. You yep. collected the cool, sweet Slammers. But I, I was never rich Pogs. enough to get a metal Slammer. I only had the thick oh. plastic Slammers. Clearly Those interior. Those are pretty cool. <laughs> I, you know, I have a few metal slammers in my day, but I think I got them at garage sales, real talk. So I can't like oh, flex. I love the good garage sale. Oh, me too. <laughs> but this place looks really fucking fun. And I'm glad that you did this because I know you, you got a free podcast shout out. Congratulations. You are now known to millions of people who listen to the show, right, Andrea? Millions. Yes, millions. Hey, listen, I appreciate a good barcade and starting a business is hard. Running and keeping a business up and running is even more difficult, especially if you're a barcade. People mm-hmm. 
-hmm. like maybe some people think that barcades are super popular and always busy and there are a couple that are but for from what i've experienced it's really tough to keep consistent business at a barcade yeah. but we love them so much so we love them and i'm looking at a drink menu they have stuff called gen one starter squirtle a gen one starter charmander like help put like it looks really fun so i'm absolutely gonna visit as soon as i can so yeah because you. that's not that far from you right uh yeah it's a few hours but it's but just on the other okay. side of the border right vancouver washington how about it's not I'll, Canada. i got it i'll fly up we'll do a road trip It'll be great. It'll be perfect. Leave, leave the little ones with the dads and we'll, we'll mamas yes. will go on a trip. Yes. We could do a meetup in Vancouver. It'll be great. It would be lovely. All right. Be perfect. This is our someday plan, everybody. Um, all right. Let's get to the news, shall we? <laughs> First up is the new Witcher saga has been announced from CD Projekt Red. So they kind of did this without much fanfare this week, um, but maybe it's just because they have key art and not a full trailer or anything like that and they mm -hmm. wanted you know to just get the information out there so cd project red has revealed the next installment in the witcher series of video games is currently in development with unreal engine 5 which to me was a surprise kicking off a new saga for the franchise and a new technology partnership with epic games so this i think is really exciting news Unreal Engine is super powerful, very versatile and robust. Epic has a long history of being really wonderful to work with from the developer standpoint. And I think we all can agree after some of the problems the engine had with Cyberpunk that this is honestly a really smart move on CDPR's part to say, hey, we mm -hmm. really are proud of what we were able to accomplish with our Red Engine, but Red 2.0, as described um, in the story here, um, needed just a little bit of tweaking and some help from some, the engineers over at Epic. So um, going back to the announcement about the franchise. So the Witcher series, of course, last installment was The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, which now that I've just finished season two on Netflix, Brittany, I need to go back and play that game again. Uh, I've been thinking the same thing. I've been itching to go back to The Witcher, but goddamn girl has a huge game. Yeah, it's a big time commitment for sure. And yeah. I never played through the DLC and the DLC was supposed to be same. excellent. So mm -hmm. I, I'm waiting though for the, the PS5 launch, which is yeah. allegedly this year, fingers crossed. I hope so. I mean, um, I hope so, but I don't hope so, because the pressure to play it will then become a little unbearable. Yeah, especially if it launches in the <laughs> second half of the year when Starfield is coming out. Then I'm oh, like, God. <laughs> too much too much RPG. <laughs> I can't, can't do all the RPG. <laughs> there have been a couple supplementary articles that have come out after this image was released. So the image, of course, is just the medallion, which at first glance, you're like, oh, it's just the wolf head medallion with the red eyes, the very iconic Witcher logo. And then it's like, nay, nay, this is not a wolf head. It is, in fact, a lynx head, the community suspected. And then CDPR came out and confirmed that, yes, it is a lynx. So Robert Malinowski told Eurogamer that, okay, some mysteries should not be so mysterious. I can confirm that the medallion is, in fact, shaped after a lynx. Now, the community is kind of in a froth over this because in the Witcher lore and canon, there is no lynx school of witchers. So they're like, hmm, does this mean that there's going to be a new school introduced? Because it does say a new saga mm -hmm. begins on the key art. And so people are like, this clearly means that, well, not clearly, but heavily implies that Geralt is not going to be the protagonist in this new game that maybe Siri is going to be the protagonist or potentially a new character or a different character from the franchise or some people are hoping that you get to create your own witcher oh that would be so sick and this ties in with a question we got from nova patreon.com slash what's good games hello briandria <laughs> with cd project having come out stating that the medallion in the teaser image was that of the link school do you think and or wish that this could be a witcher game where players get to create their own or do you believe they'll stick to crafting a narrative around a particular character so yeah so like it's interesting it's like like you you've covered so eloquently Thank you. At first, folks were like, yo, is that the cat medallion? Because there is a school, a cat school in The Witcher, right? And Siri carries that, not because she's a full-fledged witcher herself, in the sense that she hasn't been able to go through, I guess we're spoiling, spoiling some witcher shit here, but like, it's okay. 
Um, she hasn't been able to go through the Witcher trial because no woman has survived the Witcher trials. They all like, they all die. They just die during it. It's just a thing that happens. I think 40% of men die through the trials as well. Anyway, so in Exhibit A, Andrea, in, in our show notes here, it looks more like a lion slash cat. You know, it's like, okay, like the one on the left is what Siri carries on her. I think it's her belt. And she got that from killing someone who I think killed some of her friends who are part of the cat school. I don't know the lore exactly, but that's why she carries the medallion she carries. So now that we have this Lynx medallion, it's like, okay, does Siri start her own school? Or is this a whole new school that we get to create ourselves and, and then Siri's our like witcher. your mentor maybe maybe like I feel like she would still be involved in this in some way shape or form but as much as I love Siri like I really do enjoy her as a character I think it'd be so fucking badass to create your own witcher yeah now I guess like the problem with that is like if you're gonna go with the lore you can't create a female witcher unless like they really shake some shit up but we could be like a, a mage or you know like Yennefer for example if you're gonna play as a woman anyway can you lots imagine of if they let you here. do different types of like if you just didn't have to be a witcher if you could be a sorceress or a I, druid sorceress. or something else from yeah, this exa- universe that would be cool that's it that's what I'm saying that would be so sick like if you want to play as a woman you're a sorceress if you want to play as a male character okay then you're a witcher I mean I don't know if that's the route they would go but it could be something cool like that either way like I am very excited for this. I, I'm sad Geralt's story has come to an end, but listen, like we got three games with him. I love that guy to death, but I'm excited to see what can come of this, what can come of the lore of this game. Like, where can they take this? And I think everyone's really itching for some, you know, CDPR Witcher goodness. And I think they learned a lot with Cyberpunk. I mean, I know they they learned a lot from Cyberpunk. We know they've been very yes. tuned in with everything. So, you know, you can only imagine that The Witcher was so – The Witcher 3 is just such an incredible game. And I feel like despite air, – air quotes here – flop that Cyberpunk was, you know, they learned a lot of lessons. So taking, yes. like, already an incredible game, mixing it with a lot of lessons learned, I feel like there's just a lot of potential there. I'm very excited. Yeah. No, me too. I mean, I made the joke on Twitter that I look forward to playing this game in 2027 – um because you know <laughs> it's probably gonna be about how long it takes before it comes out mm-hmm. but um I'm hoping it doesn't take that long I don't know I just assume that this game has been in development for a while because let's see when did the Witcher 2 originally come out or the Witcher 3 I should say came so out. I was reading 2015 was the initial release date so yeah. seven years ago it, yeah, a long ass time ago. And I know CDPR said that after Cyberpunk had released, and I don't know if this was before the delay, after whatever the fuck, that that's when they were going to start really kind of working on um, the new Witcher game. And they were going to keep a large team dedicated to the multi- multiplayer DLC for Cyberpunk and then kind of start with a smaller team for The Witcher. Now, like how much that has that shaken up behind the scenes, I imagine quite a bit. Yeah. I, I mean, I would be really curious to know how much of a priority Cyberpunk multiplayer is at this point. I would say pretty big because you think they so? well yeah because they see the success of sandbox open worlds like GTA Online and why wouldn't you want to try to capture some of that especially since they I mean they did well right they've sold over we know that they have at least announced that they've sold over 13 million copies of the game I imagine that they've sold more now that the new console patch mm-hmm. is live and that they'll continue to sell more as they release DLC, I mean, and look at the legs of The Witcher 3 and how many different releases they had for that and how they kept supporting that game. And I think that, you know, Cyberpunk has the potential to, you know, reach that eventually if they keep supporting it. And I don't see why they would invest so heavily in building this massive world of Cyberpunk and not and not want to keep supporting it. They have announced that they are hiring um, because mm-hmm. they have obviously lost some people <laughs> over the last couple of years. And they did address the concerns about crunch, or at least, you know, some of the members of CDPR did, saying, you know, we clearly are reevaluating our philosophies on, on crunch because, you know, they, one of the guys in charge famously said, like, crunch is just part of, part of working in games or whatever. And everyone was like, well, well. That doesn't sound so great, guy. You should maybe reevaluate that. And so they have been. And so the the new game director, I think it was the game director, I have to double check the tweet, said, you know, not on my watch. Like, there will not be any mandated crunch. So it's like, well, that's good. 
So, so I'm I'm reading. Hold on, because I am a little confused here. So, December 2021, Tech Radar came out with something that says Cyberpunk 2077's multiplayer game has been canceled. Is that the same thing? Uh-huh. The multiplayer follow-up has been canceled following a strategy update in which President and CEO Adam Kaczynski stated the plans for the game had been reconsidered. I well, did not hear that. I, I don't know how we missed that. Maybe it was during our WGG break. Maybe we were balls deep in raising kids, but... I, was, okay. I mean, that's like three days before Christmas, so <laughs> a very convenient time to put out bad news <laughs> when people yeah, are so, not watching. So it sounds like, Andrea, just for some clarification here, is that their follow-up game to Cyberpunk was initially going to be a standalone AAA Cyberpunk multiplayer game, but that, I think, is what got maybe got botched, and now they're going to introduce multiplayer components gradually into Cyberpunk, is kind of what I'm getting. It's really weird nebu- nebulous wording. But that's, that's a good way of... to leave things when you're not sure how it's going to pan out. <laughs> there you go. Nebulous. PR speak, lady. <laughs> PR speak. It's great. No one knows what's happening to Cyberpunk, not even CDPR, apparently. It's fine. All right, next story is... PlayStation is set to acquire Jade Raymond's Haven Entertainment Studios. So this was another interesting story that dropped this week. And for people who were in my feed being like, who is Haven anyway? I was like, that's a fair question. Haven Mm -hmm. hasn't released anything or published anything. And I'll say maybe where you've heard of them is that it was the studio that Jade founded after Google Stadia dissolved their first party game development arm so essentially she had been at google stadia to oversee game development and publishing there and then stadia was like actually game development's very expensive cancel (laughs) um and so all of those developers were like uh what do we do now and then jade started her (laughs) own studio haven entertainment and uh several people who were on her team at stadia followed her there and are working with her and now sony interactive entertainment according to ign has announced that it has entered an agreement to acquire them and it will become the 18th studio to join the playstation studios family i did not realize there were that many of them Um, raymond (laughs) who was the founder of ubisoft toronto and motive studios and one of the key figures behind assassin's creed began in studios in 2021 with an investment from sie Uh, Raymond shared that the team was looking to create worlds where players can escape, have fun, express themselves, and find community. Well, that sounds nice. Uh, Uh, The new game is a live... Wait, hold on. Furthermore, it confirmed the project that the team was working on would be a new IP that would be exclusive to PlayStation. So just getting that out there right away. Not that that was going to be any surprise if PlayStation bought them. Um, This news just further cements their partnership that a new live service experience for PlayStation was built upon a systemic and evolving world focused on delivering freedom, thrill, and playfulness. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, this it, this is interesting. I'm so curious to know what the hell Jade is working on in her studio. I was reading the interview she did with IGN in October of last year, and she said there's three things that are really exciting to her in this new studio. The first one is games as a social platform. And she said, you know, now that the younger generation essentially makes, they, they form their friendships online. Like, that's something that's really exciting to them about their about their next upcoming game. So, okay, like, taking that in mind. The second thing is thinking about the remix generation, self-expression, and basically how people read their friends' blogs over, like, reading, like, actual professional articles that journalists wrote. And so, it's, and then she kind of talks about TikTok and user-generated content. In that sense, like friends' blogs, TikToks, etc., and that's kind of a motivating factor for their new game. And it's designed to be owned by the fans and can evolve through that. And like, I'm wondering, like, what does that even mean? <laughs> like, if, I mean, the first thing it it smacks up to me is media molecule. It's like, exactly. hey, this feels like a media molecule style game. And I think that media molecule makes really cool stuff. Obviously, they kind of rose to fame over. Um, Little Big Planet, and now they're doing really cool stuff with Dreams, which is obviously all UGC. But I don't know if UGC in games is the right fit for every game. Clearly, it's done gangbusters for games like Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite. Well, not really as much Fortnite, but, you know, other games. But uh, I thought for sure that Haven, given Jade's pedigree and some of the people that came with her, would be more like a AAA narrative-focused game. But yeah, 
well, you narrative and UGC just don't really mix well together. <laughs> no. No. <Nah. laughs> no, it doesn't. Yeah, so uh yeah, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. Media mo- molecule was the first thing that came to mind too in dreams and what they did with that. Um is it going to be like a second life sort of thing? Is it going to be like just a sim game? They're making a PlayStation's metaverse. metaverse. <laughs> Meta- that's it. It's like PlayStation Home. Remember that? Was it, it was called Home, yes. wasn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Uh-huh. That's it. Yeah. Jade Raymond is making PlayStation Home V2 confirmed. Oh, my goodness. Heard it so- here on the What's Good. Gabe Hewitt wrote in and asked, on the topic of Haven Studios, live service games at launch can make or break the life of that game. Is PlayStation taking a big risk by buying Haven before they release their first game, or can we trust these veteran game devs? I mean, I think it's always going to be a risk, even if it's veteran game devs. Uh, we, we've seen veteran studios flop on their first outing before. You know, I'm not going to name mm-hmm. names right now. But, I mean, it's happened. Mm-hmm. And we've also seen unknown studios launch with really amazing stuff as well so i think the fact that jade does have a pedigree obviously was what led playstation to invest in her and the studio and i think you need to remember gabe that because she's part of the playstation studio system she has pretty unfettered access to all of those other studios which are phenomenal groups of developers so I think that I think that they'll be okay. She could, you know, hit up Insomniac, Naughty Dog, Media Molecule, Ben, Bungie, Bungie. Now, oh my God, I keep forgetting that. Um, <laughs> you know, S- S- Sony Santa Monica, Santa Monica San Diego, like, or excuse me, Sony San Diego. Like, there's, yeah, they'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. And if not, they'll just become a support studio. That's how the world works, Gabe. Uh, well, you know, hopefully they'll be able to keep their jobs and not lose them like what Google did to them. Moving right along, the next story is a fun one. Ghostbusters yeah. Spirits Unleash has been revealed by Friday the 13th developers, Ilphonic. So Ilphonic also put out a couple other games, but I think people do mostly know mm-hmm. them um, via Friday the 13th, but they also put out um, the Alien game, which was really fun. Um, Predator, right? Predator, not Alien. That's correct. It's like the mm. 80s monster that I watched a lot of movies of, Predator. Could, <laughs> like that, I'll say that description could probably point to a lot of different characters. <laughs> so, uh, Brittany, why don't you read this while I pull up a trailer? Pull it up. We're going to bust some ghosts, motherfuckers. All right. So this comes from GameSpot. Friday, the 13th developer, developer Ilphonic has revealed its newest asymmetrical multiplayer game, Ghostbusters Spirits Unleashed. Currently scheduled for release on PC, Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, PS5, and PS4 in Q4 2022, the game will see you join three other players as you strap on a proton pack and help clean up paranormal infestations in New York City. The game is filled with several pieces of iconic Ghostbuster equipment as you'll track down ghosts using a PKE. PKE beater, wrangle them with the aforementioned proton pack and neutrona wand. I feel like Andrea trying to pronounce Pokemon names. <laughs> and finally, bag him up with a ghost trap. Just remember, when the light is green, the trap is clean. If you prefer to cross on over to the other side, you'll be able to play as one of several types of ghosts and cause some havoc. Ghosts have a range of skills that include flight, intangibility, and the ability to possess inanimate objects. If a Ghostbuster gets too close to you while playing as a phantom, you can also use your slime powers to summon a few minions that'll leave the paranormal investigators drenched in ectoplasm. Adding some more authenticity to the game is the inclusion of Ernie Hudson and Dan Aykroyd, who reprise their roles of Winston Zidemol and Ray Stunts, respectfully. Zedemol is now in charge of the Ghostbusters and assigns missions, while Stance has plenty of information to share from his occult bookshop. You'll also be able to customize your Ghostbuster or Ghost, upgrade equipment, and enhance your abilities as you progress through the game. While it may be a multiplayer game, Ilphonic added that AI companions will also be available for anyone who plays Ghostbusters Spirits Unleashed in solo mode. Now, one Greg Miller, Andrew, you may have heard of him. That Uh, guy. He's a, he's a voice in this game, and I listen to kind of funny games daily because I wanted to hear I wanted to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Not that Greg is a horse, but I wanted to hear him talk about his experience and yada yada. I did not understand one word that man said. I just smiled and nodded. But what I can say is I could feel the enthusiasm and the excitement coming from him. I know this is probably such a dream project and opportunity for Greg. So congratulations, Greg! I'm very happy for you. 
Yes, indeed. Congratulations. It must be like a dream to work on such an amazing franchise. But also want to throw a big congratulations oh, yeah. to James and Elise Willems, who announced that they are writing this game. What the? That's so fucking cool. It this is so cool. Man. I didn't yeah. know that they had aspirations to write a game and then they just drop that they're working on a Ghostbusters game. Yeah. That's awesome. So congrats to them as well. And I hope that we can get them back on the show so we can kind of pick their brains about it. How fun to work yeah. on such a cool project with your partner like that. I'm sure that it's just super exciting. Uh, Absolutely. They seem pretty pumped about it on Twitter. Oh, so yeah. um, if you guys follow them, go give them a like a virtual high five. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So excited for them. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think we've got all the all the details on that game. We will uh, look forward to checking that out. I honestly think that it's impressive that it's coming out later this year. Yeah, I know. Props. Kept that one under wraps. Well, no, actually, it kind of got leaked a little bit, didn't it? I know one of the actors yeah, kind of was talking maybe, about it. Maybe yeah, yeah. Just a little yeah, leak. yeah. You're right. That's right. Yeah, you I remember know that now. Leaks happen. happen. Uh, yeah. We have just a couple more news items to get through. So after we recorded the show last week, you guys may have remembered that there was a state of play on Thursday specifically dedicated to Hogwarts Legacy. So I wanted to pull up um, a little bit of details. I'm not going to go over everything because I'm sure by now, if you are interested in that game, you have already looked it up and checked it out. But they did have a like a 15 minute state of play um, which, you know what, honestly, this is the wrong video. Let me pull, let me pull the state of play up so I can have a few more minutes of footage here to, so many to show you guys. You well, know? But Brittany, the question really is, did you watch any of this? No. No, none of it. Okay. So now you're going to get to see some of it, I guess. I'm let very just, excited. Let me just scroll forward here. Um, I think this is some Andrew Renee bullshit. I mean, it's definitely some Andrea Renee bullshit. So I'm just going to let the state of play kind of roll in the background here while we have a little chat so you guys can take a look. We're obviously not going to show the what whole the thing. Um, so if you guys want to check it out, obviously the PlayStation channel is the best place to do that or, of course, the WB Games channel. So Harry Potter Legacy, if, for people who aren't familiar, is a game in development by Avalanche. So this is the studio that was, I believe, acquired by WB Games. But maybe you remember Ooh. them from Disney Infinity. So that game was a Toys to Life game that had little Disney toys, which seems like, God, that game seems like it was forever ago. We yeah. haven't really heard from them in quite some time, and it's because they've been working on this game. And the game is slated to come out holiday 2022 for PS4, PS5, PC, Xbox One, and Xbox Series X, and is being, of course, um, co-developed with Sony Interactive Entertainment. And I think what is, what's interesting about this game is that um, – there's obviously a lot of controversy surrounding this. So I tweeted about this game that I missed watching the state of play live because I was, you know, babying. And mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of gauge people's excitement about the state of play, if people were pumped or not. And it seemed like it was very split and it was very black and white. There was mm -hmm. nobody in my feed going, meh, it looks fine. It was either people who were oh my gosh, this game is fulfilling every childhood fantasy I had about Harry Potter. I cannot wait. It looks amazing. Or on the other side, it was people being like, hard pass, J.K. Rowling is a monster. And she is. it's really, really just the worst that her actions and her bigotry and the message that she's been putting out on social media has to taint this game and it, all of the developers and really like the thousands of people within Warner Brothers and Avalanche that have been working on this for years because she is not involved in the development of this game at all. And I get the argument that she still owns the IP. So anything that any profit that's made from this game, she's going to get a piece of no matter what. And I don't want to be a part of that. And I 100% respect that decision. And I had some conversations with some people on Twitter about it. And I thought it was really, you know, really productive hearing people's opinions about how they felt, feel about it. If they're conflicted about what to do as a fan. And we've talked about this on the show before about how do you balance your feelings of a long history that you've had with a franchise of media versus the actions of the person who created that media and I know that this has come up kind of several times in the in the world of media not just video games but movies and music it's like 
hey, is this music artist turned out to be like a completely terrible person? Am I still allowed to listen to their music? Um, same with like movies and things like that, right? And so I had some um, good conversations with some people and I really appreciated everyone's perspectives. I'm going to try to pull up that thread right now because there was some really good stuff that was linked to me um, in that thread that we were talking about of people being like, hey, like, how do I how do I kind of like process my feelings about all of that, knowing that like this game looks really cool and I'm so excited to play it. But like, yo, it mm -hmm. just feels so gross and icky. What do I do about that? Um, and so what I would point to you guys is a tweet that I retweeted from at get good girl. And she had tweeted to me an article from at Jesse gender who writes for GameSpot and had an article called JK Rowling's anti-transgender stance and Hogwarts legacy. And it's a very in-depth, very long feature article recounting kind of where, this controversy began what the movement that jk rowling is seemingly the figurehead for now i mean back in the beginning when she first started kind of popping off on twitter there could have been an argument made that she didn't know what she was getting into and she could have just walked away at that point and backed away mm -hmm. and been like oops my bad wasn't trying to you know be an asshole but that's not what happened. Instead, over the last couple of years, she's in fact, as I wrote on Twitter, quadrupled down on some of these positions. And it's been just for Harry Potter fans like myself, it's just been like such a giant fucking bummer that she's now turned out to be a terrible person. And I'm like, why? Come on. There's like so few women auteurs that are in the status that she is at. And now it's like, now I can't be a fan of yours anymore. Um, mm -hmm. It sucks. Um, just be, just be good. Just, be happy for people who want to just live their best life and like let them do it like why how hard is that um so the reason why i wanted to bring up my twitter thread also is that um i got a response from sindel so you guys Aww. may remember sindel from our community video that happened oh my gosh what year was that is that last year um, two years ago gosh that must have been 2020 you oh, think man. was it that long ago um I can't oh my remember gosh. what is what is even the concept of time anymore <laughs> honestly like it's so hard to remember even if things from a couple of days ago so um that's probably why I'm like, like wait what happened I don't know um <laughs> so I'm looking up um her tweet but essentially what um, she kind of wrote to me and was like, hey, I am, you know, a transgender woman. So clearly J.K. Rowling's hate is pointed directly at me. But I'm still excited for this game because the franchise means something to me. And and I think that if you don't know how to feel about it and you're having trouble processing, you know, Jesse Gender's article, I think, is a really great backdrop to kind of educate yourself on the issue if you're if this is the first you're hearing of it because it's clear from my thread that there was people who follow me who are fans of Harry Potter who are very excited about this game have no idea about JK Rowling and the things that she's said and the things that she's uh, done ignorance and, is bliss sometimes yeah I mean I I don't blame people for for that because sometimes it's really really challenging to keep up with all the assholes in the world who are in charge uh -huh. of things <laughs> Uh-huh. Um, I found Sindel's response to you just so we can read it like verbatim. Oh, sure. Sindel said, uh, cause you said, Hey, what, are, what's your temperature on this? Um, and Sindel said, this is the Harry Potter game. I've wa waited my whole life for, I cannot wait. Know that this is coming from a trans woman, literally the direct target of JK Rowling's hate. So it's extremely hard to separate that from the magical fantasy I surrounded myself in during my childhood. Wish she could just keep her mouth shut, sitting on top of all of her freaking money. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Couldn't have said it better myself. And I think a lot of people feel the same way as Sindel. Like, hey, like, I want to love this thing. Can you just, like, disappear? Stop. <laughs> yeah. Can you just, like, go away, please? <laughs> go, like, far away. Yeah. It's, it's you know, like you said, Andrea, we, we've talked about similar situations before. And I... I don't think there is a right or wrong way t to feel. And what I think is I think everyone knows the general consensus is like JK Rowling is, is a monster, like asshole. Why are you a bad person? Who knows? But when it comes to supporting this game, I don't want to be the one, the judge who's like, you can feel this way or you cannot feel this way. And if you feel this way, you're an asshole. And if you feel this way, you're just encouraging the hate. And it's, 
it's a hard, hard thing. And I know a lot of people don't like that stance. They want it to be black and they want it to be white. But it's just, I feel like emotions and the way people process things, we're all wired differently. And if you want to like this game, if you want to support this game like Sindel does, then I think that's fine. I think that's your choice. I'm not here to tell you what you can and can't do. And before you shit on people for wanting to enjoy something that could bring them a lot of joy and for wanting to enjoy something and support the people who are working on this, I would just encourage you to, you know, just like take a breath and let people do what they want to do when it comes to this. If they want to enjoy it, cool. If they want to pass on it, cool. But I don't know. I guess I just have an issue with it when people are just so quick to judge others for liking what they like. Yeah. 100% agree. And you know, just so people kind of see where I'm going to be at with this, obviously my opinion of it is probably going to evolve before this game comes out, you know, later this year. But my stance is if this game completely flopped, if it didn't sell z any copies, if it literally sold zero copies and they spent millions of dollars on the development, it's not going to change the way J.K. Rowling feels and what she does with her platform. And it's obviously not going to change the billions of dollars she already has. But what could potentially be good for the trans community is if I make a donation to a trans charity or a trans activism group for the purchase price of what the game is or what I plan to spend on the game to help offset any potential harm that's going to continue to come to that community from the words in the platform that, you know, Rowling is using. And I was like, you know what? I think that that's a way that I can come to terms with being able to support the huge team of developers and creators who have been working on this game for years. And a lot of the developers have come out and said that this is their dream game to make and that they are so excited to be able to work on this amazing franchise that has meant something to them. So I think, you know, like Brittany said, Make the decision for yourself. I do, again, encourage you at Jesse Gender's um, article on GameSpot. It's a great place to go to educate yourself on what's going on. And um, hopefully, you know, you can kind of figure out for yourself what's going to be the best for you and your mental health. And as always, mm -hmm. if you, you know, are struggling and you need someone to talk to about how to process your feelings, takethis.org is a great place to go for resources on how to you know, take good care of your brain and mental health because it's important. I will say, Avalanche Studios is making something that looks very pretty. Oh, the game looks real cool. That's oh, like the, that's the rub, <laughs> right? Is that the game looks real good. So it's an open world adventure. Let me just read a couple blips about the game, right? I don't want J.K. Rowling to take up all the oxygen out of this story because the game does look really, ba really bananas. Um, so in Hogwarts Legacy, the player character is a new wizard or witch, and I'm reading from the Polygon story about it, except they're starting as a fifth-year student, so the introduction will bring, bring players up to speed on the game's systems and controls, as well as bring the character into the present story. That involves some intrigue involving goblins and dark wizards, and the tutorial stages, as we see in the state of play, have appeared to involve investigating a goblin rebellion with an all-new NPC, Professor Fig, and there's a darker path hinted at later. And there's a lot of thoughts on the internet about if you should be able to pursue dark magic or not, which we will go into sometime in the future. Um, Hogwarts Legacy also appears to touch all of the familiar traits of an action RPG, including crafting both potions and magical items, skill and perk trees, friend and follower parties, and where NPCs add special talents to your adventuring group, which looks cool. Uh, the Room of Requirement could also be found inside the Academy. Uh, obviously, if you miss it, Hogwarts is the setting for this game, though you will be able to venture outside of Hogwarts, as we see in the state of play. And it serves, of course, as a customizable hub area between stores missions now I think the game just looks oh. great I mean the graphics look great the idea that you can kind of create your own witcher wizard is really cool I love that they made the choice to make you a fifth year so that you are a little bit older and you have more experience you're doing more advanced spells and the combat looks cool creatures in this world are, are wonderful and I think that this has potential to be a really really cool game Oh, yeah. Like, I'm just kind of frothing at the mouth over here. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, yeah, I've been very like, – I don't know shit about Harry Potter. I'll be real. I know, like, there's a sorting <laughs> hat. I took. I think I did the sorting hat quiz with y'all back in, like, 2017 when What's Good had just launched, and that was fun. I don't remember what, what – whatever school I landed in. Is that what they're called? Schools? They I, are. Yeah. Yes, houses. Okay, yeah. That's what they're called. House, excuse me, houses. You're in the school um, of witchcraft and wizardry, and then there's four houses to choose from. Oh, but damn, girl, this is, this is looking real good. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Yeah. I mean, you get to ride a hippogriff. Like, what the heck, Yeah, man? oh, I, I love riding hippogriffs, especially when I got to go to the grocery store and get my milk. You know, just hop on the hippogriff, go down there. Can you milk hippogriffs? Who could say? <laughs> Maybe that's where you get your milk. What the fuck is a hippogriff? Oh, my gosh. Oh. I love you, Brittany. Um, so it looks cool. I, I realize I probably talked a little bit longer about this game that I intended to, but that's knowing okay. knowing that we have a lot of amazing trans people in our community here at What's Good Games – that have very valid concerns about this game and obviously about J.K. Rowling's actions. I wanted to make sure that we addressed it and that we didn't just like go like, oh, yeah, it's a thing that's happening. Because clearly mm -hmm. I've talked about my love for Harry Potter and how like it's been hard for me as a fan to kind of reckon with what do I do as a fan of this thing. And I think a lot of us had hoped that it would stop <laughs> and it hasn't. <laughs> And it's like, it sucks. Uh, there just needs to be an island, Andrea, where all the shitty people go. Cut off from all communication. Like, give them no yeah. Wi-Fi. Just send them. Let them be on their way. And they can just do backflips in their own universe, spouting off all their terrible takes. Yeah, exactly. Just send her to an island, you know, with some other terrible people who shall yeah, not be named. Great. <sighs> anyway... We have a couple other quick news blurbs. Uh, Mass Effect's co-creator has a new studio, and they're working on an all-new science fiction universe. Hmm. Uh -huh. well, so the studio, well, well. Uh, Casey Hudson, we're, who we're talking about, their new studio, Humanoid Studios. Yeah, they're working on an all-new science fiction universe, and they dropped some art, and Andrea looks like. And granted, it's just key art. This doesn't mean shit. But it's Casey Hudson, and you look at it, and you're like, whoa, 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 you clench a little bit. You know what I mean? I hadn't seen this art, so let me let me pull it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the images up. show a massive skull of something being approached by people in spacesuits, a beautiful mountainous region with spacecraft, a bar that overlooks the moon, which looks fucking sick, and two more people in spacesuits loading up containers of some sort. Quote, by combining excellence in the arts with innovative technologies, video games have the extraordinary power to transport you to worlds of adventure. That's what first inspired me to make games and is at the heart of what we do at humanoid studios hmm. so mm -hmm, yeah like look at that like i think that looks again it's just art like, you know you've been burned by art yeah it's like it's kind of got vibes at first you're like ooh, feels a little no man's sky then you're like mm -hmm. mm, this looks a little like prey mm -hmm. and then this one reminded me instantly of um death loop and I think that's more of like the retro aesthetic inside this bar, but then there's like clearly some kind of moon back there. And then this one just screamed Horizon to me. Yeah. It all look, I, I, I'm excited. Casey Hudson, whatever you're making, I'll put a down payment on that shit. I mean, Let's yeah. Go. Legacy. Yeah. 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 Your yeah. legacy, sir, has earned you some some pre predetermined goodwill. Um. <laughs> So hopefully, hopefully it's going to be cool. Um, Tekken Bloodline animated series has now been announced by Netflix. Netflix just like left and right, pew, 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 all the series for geek and gaming, which Andrea, is real quick, bonkers. I have a list. I have a list oh, of, yes, go over it. of Nef upcoming Netflix shit that we have upcoming. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the Resident Evil live action series. We have Tekken Bloodline, Assassin's Creed live action film, Cyberpunk Edge Runners, Splinter Cell animated series, Tomb Raider anime series, the Bioshock film, Beyond Good and Evil live action, Sonic Prime, which is a 3D animated series, Dragon's Lair live action film starring Ryan Reynolds, of course, and then you have the Division live action film with Jake Gyllenhaal. Like, holy fuck. And that's not to mention all the other stuff they already have out there. It's unreal. That seems that's like like, like too much stuff, Netflix. Too much. That's just, that, those are some solid ass IP. Speaking of Resident Evil, the new oh. Resident Evil, July. Oh. Oh. It's coming, Andrea. Oh. You tweeted about it. I think you're right. I think this is the one thing that can pull me away from Judge Judith Shinelin. We'll see. I'm going to watch it. Coming July 14th. Of course ladies you will. You can't help yourself. You're going to have to. Oh, oh yeah. I want to know who the fuck boned, out, boned Wesker to make two kids. <laughs> who would bone that man? You know what I mean? Um, I mean, listen, I'm not here to judge. <laughs> You you do you, boo. Um, speaking of TV shows based on video games, a Plague Tale TV show is in the works. Yeah, great. Let's go. Give me all the CG rats. So, 
mean, I'll, I could pass on the rats. Um, so this was spotted by Eurogamer French website Alicine announced that the extraordinary medieval fantasy world of A Plague Tale will be adapted to a TV series with plans to keep the show, quote, closer to its settings and to the game. The original mm-hmm. Bordeaux-based developer Asobo, rather than being handed over to any of the U.S. production studios that have shown interest. Interesting. So this is Focus yeah. Entertainment, who is behind this. And, I mean, the game is pretty oh, great. It's good. So it should it's be really great. should be cool. Uh, yeah. M- Matthew Mateu. Matthew, Matt, Matt, Matt Turry, Matt Turry, Matt, sorry for butchering your name, uh, who was an assistant director on Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards, confirmed his involvement in the series on Twitter, saying I'm honored to work on the adaptation as a TV series of A Plague Tale. Thank you to Asobo Studios and Focus Entertainment for their trust. I can't wait to bring Amicia and Hugo's journey to the screen. Is that how you say her name? Mm-hmm. Yes. You Names are hard, it. everybody. Uh, all right, continuing right along. In case you missed it, Sefton Hill at Rocksteady said that Kill the Justice League, their highly anticipated follow-up to the Arkham series, is delayed until spring 2023. So we already knew the game was delayed. But now Sefton Hill is like, yo, this is when you can expect the game to come out. It's like a year from now. Hold <laughs> tight. It's going to be dope. I'll hold on to my butt, Andrea. Keep holding hold it. Hold on to it real. Each cheek, one hand. Let's go. Wait. Each cheek, two hands. You can't do both cheeks with one hand. You can't do that. I mean, have you you'd have to, to split, gra- you'd have to split the crack in order to get both. <laughs> I was just going to ask you if you ever try to grab both cheeks with one hand, and then I guess, yeah, you'd have to go for a meaty middle grab there. Yeah. yeah okay. It'd be, it'd be challenging depending on the size of your cheeks, but you could get a little bit of each one, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the distance between the crack, it can't be that large for anybody, no matter how fat your ass is. Fat with a P. Obviously. I do. Yeah. Important discussions here in Most Good Games. Hmm. If you haven't tried grabbing both cheeks with one hand, do it right now. Do it while you're driving. Just keep one hand on the wheel. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. We'll wait. Just we'll reach wait, down us- into your pants. Mm-hmm. Touch your butt. Feels nice, right? Feels we should good. all touch our butt a little bit more often and remind ourselves that we're a beautiful person. <laughs> and on that note, let's take our first break of the show. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. It is the second segment of the What's Good Games podcast. And this is what we talk about. <clears throat> this is where we talk about what we've been playing. <laughs> so, Brittany, before we get started, I want everyone to know that I have full intentions to talk about Tiny Tina's Wonderlands next week. That game just came out. The reviews so far seem to be very positive. But I want to make a note that Gearbox and 2K offered me a code on PC and I said, hey, that sounds groovy, but I don't play games like this on my PC because I like sitting on my couch and my progress wouldn't have carried over and I didn't want to start over. So I just decided to wait until the game came out to play on console. And I only bring that up because I normally don't bother you guys with you know, this kind of business, but it makes me just a tiny bit concerned that none of the reviews post or pre-release are console reviews. Yeah, no, I, same situation with me. I was also offered a key for PC. I said, can I have Xbox? And uh, it wasn't available at the time. Um, yeah, it, it's it's odd. That's This isn't normal. No, and I know that Gearbox has a partnership with Epic and they ha- were working with them to get crossplay in the game at launch, which I think is excellent and wonderful. But it's always just a little bit of a flag if reviewers are not giving access to console copies ahead of launch. The only other game in recent memory that has done this was Cyberpunk 2077, <laughs> and we all know how that ended up. And the yeah. PC game version of that game was lauded in- as being an amazing RPG, and the console versions, well, we all know how that turned out. So let's hope that that's not the case here, um, because the build that I played when I was up in San Francisco with Kind of Funny was indeed a PC build, but it was super fun and I had a great time. And Mm -hmm. it seems like people are enjoying their time that I've gotten hands on it. So fingers crossed the console version is also good. I know. (laughs) We're, uh, Jason and I are getting out of town this weekend and we fully plan on bringing a small TV with us, both of our Xboxes. And so we can play Tiny Tina. Yes, I love it. 
I know. I'm so excited. That, you know, that's like our shtick. We just haven't done it in fucking forever. Yeah. So, you know, kids get man. away, play some tiny teen. I know. I know. <sighs> All right. Let's uh. talk about what we have been playing. At the top of the show, I mentioned that you've been playing Horny Casino. Horny farming. But it's not Horny Casino. It's actually Horny Farming. It's, it's Horny Farming, a.k.a. Rune Factory 5. So this is absolutely like my my cocaine my bread and butter my jam my jelly my shtick and so it was funny because everyone was playing elden ring and i was i think brian was my guest that week and i'm like i'm playing something completely opposite of, of elden ring right now and it was rune factory 5 thankfully um i got thank you marvelous and exceed for my review code which i've had for about a month now because these games are beefy um so i've played maybe about 15 hours or so of this game over the past month and as you know, these games, so let me let me back up. Rune Factory, not everyone's a nerd, but remember that like you. Okay, so Rune Factory, um, its sister franchise is Story of Seasons, think of Harvest Moon, et cetera, et cetera. And it is a farming sim. But this, what's different about Rune Factory is it has more action RPG elements to it because there is a full-fledged story within this game. I mean, I say full-fledged. It's a story, and it's entertaining enough, I think, to accompany the um, the farming the farming in this game. You it's a, you have combat, you have all sorts of different weapons. There's dungeon crawling, there's monsters you tame instead of instead of farm animals. So, this game came out in Japan last year, I believe it was last May, so almost a year ago, and we just got it the twenty third of this month. And it's sitting at about a seventy on Metacritic, and I was reading a lot of. Uh, of my friends and colleagues critiques of this game. And I will say like, yeah, it's, it's fair. But I think what a lot of the reviews I read failed to capture is just like how charming this game is despite its technical flaws. So you play as a ranger who wakes up in this town called Rigberth and you've lost all of your memory. I bet you never heard of that one before, Andrea. <laughs> no, it seems like a completely original before. concept for a, for a Abs- game. Absolutely. And you find yourself in this small town, but it's kind of in the middle of this like large map with these different sandboxy areas. You have like winter, you have like snow area, you have like a volcano area, grass area. And this little town is like right in the middle of all of that. Um, And you join Seed, which is kind of like, think of like a guild, a a small guild in charge of protecting the town and defeating the monsters. But of course, some like evil plot starts to unravel ahead of you and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I really love about this compared to Story of Seasons, Friends of Pioneers of Olive Town, which came out, God, I, feel, I was still pregnant when that came out. So, God, it feels like not that long ago, but it was. Is again, like this has a full fledged story involved with it. It has voice acting, it has lovely character portraits. It's really helped with the immersion of this. And there's lots of attractive characters you can bang, Andrea Renee. And that, first and foremost, is the most <laughs> important thing in this entire game. And, um, Obviously, a farming sim, what do you do? You plant crops, you water them, you harvest them, you make money, you go out, you can find supplies by scavenging, you can destroy monsters, level up, get stronger, delve into more difficult areas of the map, find better materials, level up all of your skills. There's cooking, there's crafting, there's animal taming, there's, it's like, it's everything. There's so much happening in this game, which is why I am just so fucking addicted to it. Uh, but the other side of it where I think where I think games like this tend to fall short again, it's it's the it's the characters in the game which really make or break it for me. It's the localization team. And I'm so happy to to say that the localization team has done such a fantastic job with all of the marriage candidates in this game, with all the non-marriage candidates. Everyone in here I think is so well written and they feel so unique and so distinct from one another, and that's such a hard thing. And there's voice acting and there's like brief little like anime cutscenes. And I just, oh my God, look at it. Look at it, Andrew. Look at it. Um, I am just so into this because obviously this is, like I said, my cocaine. But um, I will say it doesn't run incredibly well. There's a lot of frame issues. The combat is incredibly monotonous and rather boring. When, you, when you're using melee combat, you do have these ability called, abilities called runes that let you equip different magic. You can maybe have like a water laser or like a fire beam or a a fireball or dark magic. And like, it helps you when you're dungeon crawling and trying to tame animals and whatnot. But 
you know, it's nothing incredible, but I don't think you come to Rune Factory expecting like incredible combat. And I think that's where a lot of the reviews I read were kind of shitting on it. But I guess, and it's a fair criticism, but I just don't think, you know, you you really weigh how's the combat in a Rune Factory game. Like, I don't think that should be like a huge like factor in it. Fair to critique it, but like, don't like shit your pants over it. Nah, I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and, you know, it's it's not it's kind of clunky to play and it doesn't do a great job at really telling you how to play the game. So if you're pretty new to farming Sims or Rune Factory in general, um, you might be a little confused of what to do. There is like an in-game message board that you can read. And I say message board. It's literally a board and you can read it a signpost and it tells you kind of how to like play the game, how certain mechanics work and whatnot. But other than that, it can be kind of confusing. So y'all have the, the the privilege of this game being out already, which means you can hop on the facts and you can like read probably guides that people have written already. Like top five things you should know about Rune Factory. And I would highly encourage you to read those if you're not new to, if you're, if you're new to this series. But um, yeah, Andrew, I'm just having a, I'm just having a really good time with it. I, so these games are broken down into seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter. And I just got into my first summer because I spend about 30 minutes a day. Like each day for me lasts about 30 minutes. So I'm about 15 hours in. I'm only through the first season. Um, so I still have quite a bit to go. I will say the story is still ongoing. It is still entertaining. It just kind of took an interesting turn. And um, yeah, I think it's incredibly charming. If you're looking for a relaxing game, you know, that really has a little bit of everything in it, uh, definitely check it out. I think it's one of the better farming sims slash action RPG sims, whatever you want to call it, that we've gotten in a long time. Um, it could be better, of course, but I think the 7 out of 70% rating it's getting on average on Metacritic is is pretty good and pretty uh, reflective. But um, it's on Switch, Switch only. If you're looking for a game that'll just, like, pass the time and just really chill you out and relax you. Oh, yeah. And they added same-sex marriages, which I'm looking at this right now. This was not included in the um, original J Japanese release, but they did patch it into that release. And now they have it, obviously, for the Western release. So props to you. Thank you very much for including that. It's about goddamn time. We love inclusion in games. Excellent. Yeah. So, anyhow, that's Rune Factory 5. If you're looking for a little thing, like I said, I think of, like, my time at Porsche. Party at Porsche. I mean, you probably remember me talking about that game. Oh, yeah. Nonstop. You talk about that game a lot. Oh, God. Yeah. This is probably like the next best. I'd say this is probably a little better. Um, but it's the same sort of thing where it's not just farming like Story of Seasons. There's a lot of other shit going on. And it's just a great time. So go Rune Factory 5. I love you so much. Thanks for melting all my time away. Meanwhile, Ghostwire Tokyo is like, yo, bitch, forget about me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw you tweeting about fishing in a JRPG. Is this the oh, game you were talking about? Yes, those motherfuckers. Like, here's the, here's the thing, Andrea. When you're fishing in any JRPG, and I don't know what your fishing experience is like in a JRPG, fish are represented by shadows, and you swat Animal Crossing. So that's it. That's the only game okay, I think you, I've you, fished in. Okay, so you're familiar with with the bane of fishing shadows. Yes. The bigger the shadow, the better the fish. It's a science. Everyone knows this. <laughs> you try so damn hard to get that big motherfucker to bite your bait. You wiggle that bait. You throw it out there. You, t you finally get that throw just perfectly on point. And it nibbles it. And it nibbles it. And time is just slow. And you're just wanting that bobber to go underwater. You want to see the ripples so you can push that B button and yank that bitch out. Oh, no. Little Minnow McGee over here decides to come over and boink takes it from you. And then the big fish swims away, and now you're stuck with a fucking sardine that no one wants. You know what I mean? God damn. Oh, man. <sighs> fucking fishing in games. Anyway. It's almost like fishing in real life. I'm so excited for fishing this spring. <laughs> I Get me on a boat in the middle of a lake. Give me a little flask, and like, let's just spend a few hours out there. I love fishing. Ah, getting outside. Doesn't that sound nice? To go outside yeah. again? It's like, oh, yeah. It's like a thing yeah. you can do yeah. in the Oxygen. world. Isn't that yeah. wonderful? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Get outside, that. everybody. Enjoy some sunlight on your face. It's good for you every mm -hmm. once in a while. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about Elden Ring. So it was really fun to have Alexa Ray on the show last week. I had a very great time, as you did as well, Brittany, having her mm -hmm. on and listening to her exploits in Elden Ring. So what's been really interesting for me as a person who has spent very little time in from software games before I 
probably played an hour of Dark Souls 3, and I probably played five to ten hours of Bloodborne, and I didn't fuck with the previous games. I was like, not my thing. Too hard. I've been actually surprised by how much of Elden Ring I've played so far. So all in now, I'm probably close to 20 hours, maybe 25 hours of the game, and I keep thinking about it. So I had this... Joke it's got you. This laughing session last night. So I was playing co-op. I wanted to try the multiplayer. That's what I want to talk about today, the multiplayer component of this game. So I reached out to my friend Maria Susu Dip for people who are in our community mm. and have seen her online. She's one of our awesome admins in our What's Good Games Discord. And I said, Hey, you are the biggest Soulsborne player that I know. Can you sherp on me? And she's like, oh, Of course I can. And then we asked our friend Beasley if she wanted to join and then friend of the show and also what's good Guardians admin for Destiny, Renjamin was like, hey, I see that you guys are playing Elden Ring. Um, mm-hmm. And so we all were in a party together because Brittany, did you know that you can technically have four people in a co-op party, but you can't play with four people you can only play with three people and then somebody can invade your game. And I was like, wait a minute. So huh? there's the game is capable of handling four people in a game instance, but one of those people has to be somebody that's trying to kill me. That doesn't <laughs> seem fun for me. That seems like a, a feature I want to turn off, but you can't turn off the PVP component. Salt in the wound. Because as we discussed last week when talking about the messages in the world, the multiplayer is one giant off switch or on switch. It's either all the features are on or all the features are off. (laughs) So you can't just play co-op without inviting someone to come kill you. Essentially, yes. I mean, and you're not going to get invaded every time, but it's highly likely that you're going to get invaded when you're playing in online multiplayer mode. Um, So it was frustrating because I was finally at a point where I wanted to try the Margit fight. And Maria's like, I got your back. Let's go. Let's go. And we were in the dungeon where this boss is trying to get to Godric, who's the bigger boss at the end of the dungeon. And we just kept getting invaded by griefers. Because oh, no. it was just so frustrating, too, because we were pre- pretty low level between. I actually don't know what Maria's level is, but I just assume that she's like pretty high level because uh, of all the weapons and gear and stuff she has. But um, Beasley was when we started level 13, which <laughs> would not recommend going to that dungeon if you were that level. Um, and I was level 28, which is a decent level to take on that fight. But when friends come into your game everybody gets nerfed your health gets nerfed your the amount of potions you can take gets halved and overall you're just weaker you can't come into somebody's game and be the the power level you're at which is a bummer because that would be very helpful in a game like this and Uh. it's a pve who cares if your friend is level 100 and you're level 30 just let the enemies don't scale anyway. So like just let nothing scale and let them un- be unscaled and come into your game. But no, From Software doesn't want you to have fun playing with your friends. They want you to suffer. <laughs> and nothing is more clear than the multiplayer component of this game because it just feels broken. And I had tweeted that it feels broken in the same way that Animal Crossing's multiplayer is broken. Mm. Both of them have excellent single player experiences and it almost feels like the game is crafted around a single player experience and then they're like but it would be cool if we gave some parts of this game that you could do with your friends but not everything we're not going to use all of the tools at our disposal (laughs) why would we do that Nah, that's dumb (laughs) um and so the functionality is is borked and broken to say the least and it's frustrating because there are certain parts of the game that you cannot do multiplayer um some of them make sense some of them just don't make sense like Mm -hmm. there's certain parts of the world that you can't cross with people like if you move into different parts you they have to literally disconnect because they'll run into like an imaginary fog wall like a a game wall and like you'll keep going and they'll be like hey i can't i can't follow you and then they have to disconnect from your party and then you have to reconnect on the other side of the wall and to connect to people in the game world, you have to use consumable items that you have to craft. And I'm like, wait a minute. So the first time I did this, I was like, wait, I have to, I have to craft an item 
Like, so I have to gather the components of this thing. And what's really frustrating about it is that it's not a, like a, thankfully it's not an obscure item. It's a very plentiful thing that you can just get anywhere. But I'm like, well, then what's the point of even making me craft it? It's just busy work now. Because obviously I can just run around and pick up a couple of these flowers. Boom, boom, boom. I've crafted, you know, the things that I need. But why then? Like, what's the point of that? I don't, That's... I don't understand. That's frustrating. And I've looked into, you know, me, I love co-op games and a game, the Souls games, I think is something I would love to play with other people because I don't, I don't like particularly challenging games by myself, but if I can throw someone, someone else in there with me, it becomes kind of a collaborative effort. And so I've looked into what's required and it just sounds like it's not very simple. It sounds like it's kind of true that if like someone dies, they and I froze. Okay. I can still hear you. Okay. I'm back. But no. So YouTube.com slash what's good game. Stink face. Now I'm catching that. <laughs> um, so is it true that like if you're playing with Maria and she shits the bed, she disconnects and you have to then re-invite her? Correct. So okay. for some reason, there's no way to revive people. You have to craft something to get them in your game. But heaven forbid, they create an item that you can craft that will actually revive somebody in your game and I understand you know I can already hear the souls bros being like yeah but you just don't understand that the way that they've designed the game and it's like hey listen like multiplayer has been part of from software games for a long time now and it clearly works differently in Elden Ring as an open world game versus their linear games of the past right so I get that there's going to be some concessions that they have to make but I think where I just kind of am banging my head against a wall is just some of the functionality just feels so counterintuitive. And it's frustrating that we're in the year 2022 and we're still kind of dealing with these things and how big this game is. It's just like the same gripes I had about Animal Crossing, right? Like, y'all, mm -hmm. I put over 800 fucking hours into Animal Crossing. <laughs> I clearly <laughs> loved that game. But my gripes about the multiplayer still exist. And, you know, Nintendo did make some improvements to it but it still like sucks to get people on and off your island just like it sucks to get people in and out of your game here you have to like you have to use the fur calling finger remedy and then they have to put their summons on the ground and they have to wait for it to appear and then if they make a mistake and they get killed either by the world or by an enemy then you have to like do it all over again and it sucks in a boss fight because clearly it's like that's oh. where co-op shines is when you're taking down big enemies together but then if they die, there's no like down but not out state where you can revive, which seems like it's a very commonplace co-op mechanic, right? I'm not being crazy here. Um, and then the, they're gone for the whole fight. And if mm -hmm. they die, they thankfully don't lose any of their runes. So that's good. So anything that you've earned up until that point, you don't, you don't lose. Um, but you also don't earn anything. And if... I'm in a boss fight with Maria and we're getting all the way to the end and somehow because she's drawing aggro she gets like the she gets a hit when the boss is down to like a sliver of health and dies and I get like the killing blow she gets no rewards for the whole fight oh. and it's like that's shitty that's literally shitty oh. <laughs> like yeah and that happened I, to I, her a couple I, times when we were playing um the other night and I felt bad because I was like she's clearly helping me I mean so hopefully it was just worth her time to help a friend but like <laughs> it would it sucks right like the the technology yeah. exists that this doesn't have to be this way and I just don't understand how somebody can defend that as a design philosophy it's like then don't include multiplayer if you want it to like be painful and all I really want and we were talking about this last night I was like it the game was fun we were having a great time just kind of walking around the world together, exploring together. But like, there's mm -hmm. so many things you can't, like so many areas that you can't enter. And Brittany, you can't level up your character while you're playing co-op with somebody. What? Yes. You literally have to leave the party, go back to your own game world, rest at a, a point of grace, and then you can spend your points, your runes to level up. And That's while wild. it's so, it's so dumb. Um, I just, it's just so frustrating. And I like I said, the technology it. exists that it doesn't have to be this way. And I hope that from software is going to improve the multiplayer functionality as time goes on, that maybe they're looking at their ship list of features that they have to get right 
for launch so the game doesn't flop on its face. They're like, listen, these things have to be functional when the game ships. And multiplayer was like at the bottom of the list for them. <laughs> and they're like, you know, we'll get to it when we get to it. And, you know, that's just the way it's going to be. And I'm hoping that it's not something that's like, hey, that's this is just the way it's designed. Enjoy. Because that's what a Animal Crossing was. A lot of it's like, no, that's just, that's just how we get people on and off your island. They come in one at a time. You know, they can't pick up things unless you give them special permissions and you can't go into your house and decorate shit. You know, like anyway, I'm not talking about Animal Crossing. The point that I'm trying to make is I'm enjoying my time clearly because I keep coming back to this game. Mm -hmm. I just have some gripes. And I the thing I said to the group last night was I just for some reason get irrationally upset when people are like, this game is the best game ever made. It's a masterpiece. And I'm like, it's not a fucking masterpiece. There's so many things that are broken and wrong with this game, but I still really like it. <laughs> I am so surprised you're still playing it. And thank you. You are now our souls expert. Congratulations. Oh, cool. Cool. <laughs> Congratulations. I love that for you. Um, oh. But, you know, you're talking about multiplayer and whatever. I feel like it's been this way in the Souls games for a while because I remember looking into multiplayer in, in these games for years now because I've always kind of wanted to hop in, but I'm not brave enough to hop in by myself. And after reading how obscure it sounded, I just always stayed away. So I can't, I don't know if they're going to fix it. I don't know if From Software is going to like try to make it better. I yeah. hope they do. I Probably really not. hope. <laughs> I don't know. Please do though. That'd be great. Um, well, shit, Andrea, I'm very impressed with you. Thanks. Good for you. You're playing it. You're, you're, I think you're really enjoying your time with it. And now I know it's, I don't have to feel the pressure. It's all you. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to hit a wall. Like, I yeah. don't see a way Literally that. Literally 50 times to open it. I saw that tweet going viral. No, no. The, the hidden, the hidden wall systems, like, that's, like I told you, Brittany, this game wants you to hate yourself. They want to punish you. <laughs> it's their goal. So you have to hit a wall like 50 times in order to. Is that what I saw? No, viral? most hidden passageways in the game are not like that. I think oh. this is just the devs probably building it in and being like, ha, ha, no one's going to find this. And then the internet's being like, challenge accepted. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, you can't hide anything from people on the internet. So I think that, you know, it's great that this game has a lot of secrets and fun stuff like that in it. But that's not that's not for me. Um, I'm not going to find all the secrets of Elden Ring. I instead am going to watch somebody else find them on YouTube and then I'm going to <laughs> speed run to wherever they are and I will cherry pick which ones I want. Um, that's pretty much the way I'm playing Elden Ring. I've made the joke that I think I've spent equal time playing Elden Ring and watching guide videos <laughs> on Elden Ring. <laughs> Thank God for those guides, Because the game doesn't tell you how to do fucking anything. Um, so I um, admire and respect the patience people have to make guides. Literally. Like, how much trial and error it must take. And you must have a certain drive and passion for that kind of shit. Because I know I don't have it. To mm -mm. find every collectible, to hit a wall 50 times to see, just to see if it works. And it Why did. Not? Oh, man. Yeah. Thank I you. read was reading a guide last night about the six, six powerful faith-based builds because faith is a difficult stat to build around in this game. And I was reading these guides. I was like, how many hours has this person played this game in order to know all of these intricate incantations and how they work with each of these weapons? And they've, they've tried all these stats. Like this guide has like all of the stats down. Like this is the number of points you put into each of these things. And these are the weapons you want to wow. equip. And this is how many smithing stones you need to invest in each of these things. And I was like, this is impressive. Like, color me <laughs> impressed about how much detail is in, in these guys. And that's just one of, like, literally thousands of guides mm -hmm. on Elden Ring. So I think what's to be lauded, of course, is the continue thing that I've said is that clearly this is a zeitgeist moment. This is a 100% uh, yeah. like trendy game of the year, right? We talk about how we always want that as a category. I feel like Elden Ring is absolutely that game. This water cooler moment that we're having around this game is a really interesting and exciting and I you know am pleasantly surprised that I'm still playing and and having a good time but I've come across some bosses that I've very fast and swiftly run away from um, uh -huh. that I'm like whoa that the boss designs are are really cool I just I want it to be smoother I want it to be a little bit better <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just a little bit better. 
it'll be fun to, to hear you talk about Elden Ring in about oh eight months when we start doing our game of the year conversations yeah months, well I no I can already tell you that this is I already am saying right now that I would never vote for this game as game of the year based off all of the things that I've said about game of the years previously uh, that we've been doing this show mm -hmm. that I think it's done a lot of things really cool now it might I doubt it but it might end up being my favorite game of the year no I feel like it's gonna take a lot to overcome horizon horizon's like chef's kiss for me um but I think that they just have failed in a couple key areas to the point where I like they absolutely deserve a pat on the back for what they've accomplished. Already said that. But to me, it just doesn't feel like it's pushed it in the same way that a lot of other open world games have really pushed the boundaries. And I mean, I think the comparisons we, that you keep coming back to and by you, I mean, the Internet's mm -hmm. conversation around Elden Ring, of course, is Breath of the Wild. Just so mm -hmm. many people being like drawing like parallels between how Elden Ring is as an archetype of a game compared to Breath of the Wild and the differences there. And I would say Breath of the Wild did most things better. But clearly, like the boss fights is like the big unique thing about Elden Ring, which we talked about last week. So, <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's neat, Andrea. Yeah. I'm glad you're – no, I'm really happy you're playing it. And I'm happy, I think, and surprised that you're still playing it and you are having a really good time with it. Uh, I think that's great. You know, you give me hope. I, I don't I don't have the courage quite yet. I'll stick to my horny farming for now. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll try to – I'll start giving all the townsfolk turnips and hope that they bang me. Uh, and I'll let you do the big girl work and – defeat bosses and, and, and get your ass kicked yeah i feel like i don't have it after having done a boss fight with friends i don't know if i ever want to attempt a boss fight on my own because in case y'all didn't know but i'm assuming if you're this deep into the episode you're fans of what's good games and you already know this about me andrea renee i have no shame in asking for help playing in baby ass baby mood and i don't take any pride in being like i beat that boss by myself i'm like now nah, i got shit to do <laughs> I got life <laughs> in the background. Somebody come in and cheese this boss for me, please. And I'll let me get one hit on it so I can get credit. And then boom, we're done. Oh, man. There's some no, few fewer things in life are so satisfying as when you're fighting a boss and it gets glitched in a corner. And you <laughs> yes. can just, you know what I mean? And you can just whack on it and whack on it. And you're like, oh, I'm so cheesing this right now. But it's the, be I don't fucking care. I'm like you. I have no shame. I don't, I'd rather defeat that boss while it's like glitched out than try it and fail 50 times. Yes. I know some people get off on that shit. Not I. No, I will gladly watch a video online of somebody else like perfecting a boss because we watched the Godric fight on YouTube before we went into the boss chamber because I was like, ah, what, what do I what I have? What am I walking into? I don't want to be surprised, y'all. I just want to <laughs> know. So obviously went to YouTube and I watched this no hit boss run where this guy like didn't take any damage. And I was like, that's incredibly impressive i was like how many times did he practice this boss fight before he got his like perfect no hit uh -huh. run and i respect people who have the time to do that andrea renee does not have the time to do that sorry maybe once we did not anymore yeah 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 i did once i used to do perfect runs in racing games and of course oh. in guitar hero and rock band i spent many many hours doing perfect runs in rock band so yeah those just different days. different strokes yeah. pun intended <laughs> all right everybody that's gonna do it for us for this week thank you so much for being here and supporting the show and we have some fun guests coming up Brittany. we have Ooh. the one and only isla hink coming to the show next week Ooh. So if you guys don't know Isla, she is part of the amazing team over at Easy Allies, and they just announced that Isla and Bloodworth are the new two co-managers as Brandon Jones is retiring. Can you believe I mean, that? I'm clapping, I'm clapping yes. because I think this is something he really wants, and yes. I'm very excited for him. And there is a lot of power in leaving something behind that you've you know what i mean like the yes. fact that he's created this awesome name for himself a fucking icon in this industry and he's like you know what i want to spend some time with my family and live my life fucking a man good for you yeah All. i'm super happy for him and hopefully we can get him on the show once he's ready to talk about his 
next thing that's coming down the road. Um, I did catch up with him the other day. And um, because if people aren't aware, his son Milo has been in the hospital, but thankfully is on the mend and doing better. And, um, you know, he told me he was going to make this announcement. And I was like, dude, this is this is iconic. Yeah. Like you leaving games is huge. But um, yeah, so he seems excited about whatever's coming next for him. So hopefully uh, we'll mm -hmm. all find out about it soon. But that's all I wanted to let you guys know. So if you have questions um, for Isla, you know, send them to us. And then, of course, check patreon.com slash what's good games for the post. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.